Hello everyone and welcome to the Leveled Up Podcast, a brand new show where we take a look at our favorite games from a couple of different perspectives. From a game design perspective where we dissect some of our favorite mechanics. And then from a casual player perspective to talk about all the fun we have together. I'm Nick. And I'm Ash. And welcome to this new show. Uh, Now first I just thought we'd talk a little bit about uh, the format of this show and kind of the idea behind it. Um, as Ash and I have been talking for a little bit now, uh, saying we wanted to make a show about games um, and, and give a little bit of a background on us. Um, so first off, uh, this show is more or less going to be a 30-minute podcast where we talk about some of, the, some of our favorite games that we've played, um, games that we've enjoyed, uh, but most importantly, games that I have played quite a lot and Ashley is relatively new to. And because of that, we're going to be looking at them from uh, both standpoints of someone who's who's been in the game for quite a while and someone who's who's just coming in and seeing if we have any kind of differing opinions or anything like that, right? Yeah, I mean, I'm just here to have fun. If it looks <laughs> cute and it's easy to play, I'm here for it. Exactly. So we'll be taking a look uh, at a whole bunch of different games we played, but I'm sure after we run out of that content, uh, then we will be playing any new games uh, that we come across or that are coming out. Um, this first game in the very first episode, which we'll get to in just a minute, is probably my all-time favorite game, uh, which is why I wanted to start this podcast uh, with it today. Uh, but first, a little bit of background on both of us. Um, so my name is Nick. Uh, I'm one of the hosts of the Leveled Up podcast, and I actually graduated school with a degree in game design. Um, I also have created several games uh, in my lifetime, and a couple, one of them is published on Steam. Uh, and I'm Ash, your other co-host. Um, uh, I don't have a degree in game design, and I don't make games. But I am excited about this, so let's let's go for it. <laughs> exactly. Uh, so I think between a little bit of, of uh, the knowledge and the fun aspects, I think we can we can break apart games uh, in kind of a unique way so that anyone can can look at it and enjoy them from from any different perspective. I think that's that's what we're trying to do here is get to the bottom of why newer casual players, have fun in these games and then what design elements behind them make that happen, right? Yeah, I mean, I learn I learn something new almost every single day because I, I like a game that, you know, to me is, is easy enough that I can play and I don't get too frustrated, um, unlike this game we're going to talk about today. <laughs> right. But Nick always decides to tell me <laughs> what it really means behind the scenes and it's pretty cool. So uh, without further ado, uh, Ash, what is the very first game we're going to be talking about on the Leveled Up podcast? What a great question, Nick. You know, this is a game that I didn't want to play for the longest time. (laughs) Uh, I was super intimidated by it, and I always watched you play it, and it looked like hell, let me tell you. Um, But this this game is um, Enter the Gungeon. Yes, Enter the Gungeon, which I, it's definitely my all-time favorite game. Uh, And I I will get into why later on in the podcast, uh, but... Enter the Gungeon has, has held a special place in both of our hearts. Uh, do, do you want to give us an overview of what Enter the Gungeon is? Yeah, let me look at my notes real quick. Okay. Um, so it's a, a roguelike bullet hell. Um, that's the extent of my notes, but it's a really <laughs> fun um, single and multiplayer shooter that you all look like little bullets. I don't know, it's cute. It's fun, it's frustrating as anything, but like you said... It's grown to be one of my favorite games. I think it's one of my go-to games whenever we want to play something. And, you know, that's saying something. Right. Yeah, I, I mean, you, you pretty much hit it on the head there. Uh, yes. It is a roguelike bullet hell, which is kind of its claim to fame. Um, which is, is a very uh, important genre. Uh, because roguelike actually happens to be one of my favorite genres uh, of all time. I play a lot of roguelike games. Uh, so as soon as Enter the Gungeon was released, I was very intrigued, to say the least. Hey, uh, Nick. Uh, yeah, what's up? What is a, a roguelike? Uh, great question. Uh, we actually uh, devoted three entire class periods in one of my classes to <laughs> discussing this, um, believe it or not. But a roguelike uh, is a game that is quite simply like Rogue, which was uh, a game that came back out back in the 90s, I think, um, on computers uh, in public school libraries, actually, is where it came out, where you played uh, a character that specifically... When you died, uh, you lost all of your progress, and you had to restart the game again from scratch. And most notably, the game was different every time you did, whether it was different enemies that spawned, or different items to find, or sometimes even different room layouts, depending on the type of the game. Uh, Rogue was pretty novel in the fact that it was the very first game to 
introduce this permadeath but restarting situation. So a roguelike is a game that kind of emulates that as soon as you die, you have skill that will carry over into your next playthrough. However, the next playthrough is going to be entirely different. Can't confirm. So just like Gungeon. <laughs> yes. Um, so I actually started playing Edge of the Gungeon, I think back in maybe mid to late 2016. Whoa. I know, right? It's weird to say that that's four years ago now. <laughs> that's, that's very strange. Uh, it very quickly became one of my favorite games, though. Um, I, How many I, hours do you think you've put into it? In total? Yeah. Oh my god. Many, many hours. I want to say, so I, I looked at the Switch the other day because I, I purchased it on my laptop back in 2016. Um, and I played it a lot. And then as soon as it was released on the Switch, I immediately bought it again. And on the Switch, I think we have 160 hours on it. That's uh, it? Oh, just on the Switch. Yeah, well, then that's not including your Switch. Well, I was going to say, I have 120 hours on my Switch. I know, I know. We, we play a lot on your it Switch as well. It is my most played game, which is surprising because I play a lot of Stardew. You do play a lot of Stardew. Actually, I think I can check right here. It, it might take me a minute to pull up, but I'm pretty sure I can Steam track this sort of stuff, even though this is not my laptop anymore. Uh, but I may be able to, uh, to check. Ooh, it's right there. Go up. Uh, 228 hours uh, All right. just on the PC. So, you know, about 400 hours. Yeah, it's yeah, give or take. chunk change right there. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't want to know how many days that I was is. Say. <laughs> That's quite a lot of days. <laughs> kind of scary. <laughs> um, but it just goes to show you how fun uh, this game actually is. Uh, so I started playing it uh, and quickly realized that it was local co op, uh, which is absolutely fantastic. I think there should be more local co op games. But the weird selling point of this local co-op is the fact that even though there's a wide cast of characters that we're going to talk about in a minute, you can only play as player one can select any character, but player two has to be a specific player two character called the cultist, right? Oh, I thought he was the apple. Well, that's the, the alternate skin <laughs> uh, that you can unlock for him. Um, but I thought that was very interesting for a, a local co-op game to do because I, don't, I can't remember a game that specifically locks player two like that. Um, so that was kind of fun, but I, I played that for a little while with a couple of friends back home uh, and I immediately got addicted Like it was it was very addicting right away. I know the feeling. Yeah, uh, played it um, And then uh, as soon as it came out on the switch I got it. I think it was 2018 that it came out on the switch um, I will double check that uh, and then I started playing it and then you started to watch me play it on the mm -hmm. switch Yeah, I mean it's probably for I would say what? At least a year, a year and a half, I would just watch you play. Yeah. You play with our friend Nico a lot. And I, the agonizing pain that I would see you both in kind of stressed me out. <laughs> I mean, anything about it. There was screaming. There was reviving. There was um, secret walls. Anything about it. Didn't call my name at all. No. No. Yet, you ended up picking it up. Yeah. Uh, surprising, honestly. You had a lot of force in me actually picking it up. Yeah. Uh, we started off playing um, Blazing Beaks, Blaze and Beaks yes. which Nick did a smart thing. We'll talk about this game probably in a future podcast, yeah, we will. but a uh, cute game with little ducks. Yeah. That's all I'll say. The, the, <laughs> the difficulty curve is a lot easier in that one than it is in Gungeon, which actually brings us to our next point of how was the difficulty when we started this bullet hell? Because normally, bullet hells are known for being egregious in difficulty just so difficult that the people have a hard time picking them up and sticking with them except for a very specific subsect of players that like that almost sadistic level of gameplay See, you say that i don't like it <laughs> no, the amount of times like that i've rage quit this game and thought i would never pick it up again too many to count of course yeah, I, I totally. I mean, when I first started playing, it, it's one of those games uh, like Binding of Isaac, which we will also get into later, uh, where it's kind of subdivided into floors. Um, so as soon as you kind of beat a floor, that's almost like a checkpoint uh, of, or levels, as you'd say. Um, so as soon as I started playing, I mean, there was a while I couldn't get past floor one. It's one of those games that combines uh, dungeon crawling hack and slash with shooting bullet hell mechanics, which is such a cool concept. Like, can, can we just talk about that? That's just... That's an incredible thing for a game to do, because usually roguelikes are all about uh, a melee, like top-down or side-scrolling, and you have lots of swords and lots of weapons that you can throw, but very rarely is there gunplay um, in, really? in, in fantasy setting stuff, at least. I mean, you will find roguelikes and stuff, but a game that's completely dedicated to... I mean, they make it a point to even say melee weapons are not a thing. Like, mm -hmm. they, they just say that everything is, is bullet hell related, mm -hmm. um, which I think is fantastic. But the difficulty curve was steep. But it's one of those games that as soon as you start to master its difficulty levels, it's so satisfying, right? The first time you kill a boss, 
than the oh, first yeah. time you kill a boss without taking damage. Mm -hmm. uh, you feel like there's actually a level of mastery uh, to the game, which is something that I really wanted to talk about. Oh, I think mastery might be a big term to use. Yeah. Yeah. Why I would that? say that halfway through my uh, Gungeon journey, I made it to floor five. That's which right. We'll talk about <laughs> last floor. Yes. I thought I was on top of this world. Steep curve going down. <laughs> Let me tell you. <laughs> well, yes, that, that may be the case. Um, but the fact of the matter is, a, a really alluring fact of a lot of roguelikes is because it introduces a permadeath mechanic of after you die, you restart the game, like we had mentioned. Uh, really, some of the only things that carry over is the player's extrinsic skill mm -hmm. or skill that they learn out of the game. Think of this as something like muscle memory, right? So just being able to know what buttons on the controller do what or having a, a split second reaction of knowing the game so well that pressing the dodge at the exact right second without even thinking about it anymore is, is what's going to, uh, you know, deter a win from a loss. Oh yeah, that's completely true. I mean, I played this game so much that when I'd go back to any other game, I mean, as Stardew... Um... Cuphead, uh, all of them that I, I just get so confused. Like, why am I not going faster? Like, why doesn't why isn't this the dodge roll button? Like, why isn't this the shoot button? Yeah. I get so frustrated because my hands and my brain think any game is like this because I put so many hours into just playing Gungeon. Oh, totally, yeah. Um, and it's one of those things where it's it's a game you enjoy getting better at. Mm -hmm. You can see skill of other... I, one of my favorite things to watch you do was as soon as you picked up the game for the first time, and after we stopped playing co-op and I would just watch you play single player, uh, y you could avidly see you, actively see you getting better at the game. You know, you'd go away for a little bit, and then as you would come back, you would get better and better, and then as soon as you cleared the first floor, I remember how happy you got. And it was just amazing to see the actual skill progress, because mm -hmm. it's something that I think a lot of viewers can't really track in a lot of current games, right? You can obviously tell when people are really good at a game or really bad at a game, but it's so hard, and I think Gungeon makes it really easy because of those floors, right? Mm -hmm. it, it's almost like a checkpoint system where as soon as you beat the first floor, it's such a specific difficulty level that it really is like clearing level one. Like if you go back to games of old, you would beat the easiest level, and then the levels would go medium and harder and stuff like that. And that's really what Gungeon kind of emulates, right? The first floor, quite literally, the enemies have less health. Yeah. And then the further on you go, it's not even just that there's more rooms or more dangers. The enemies, their health just scales, you know, higher. Mm -hmm. Even easy enemies you find on floor one just get double the health and so on and so no forth. No question. So yeah. I know, like, the enemies, they uh, get harder and harder. But what about the chests? Do they get better and better? Yeah. So uh, as the game goes on, um, there is... And I was going to talk about this as we go through the gameplay... Uh, but one of the best random elements of the game, of course, is finding the items uh, that kind of comes throughout the game. Um, so not only do the enemies get harder, uh, like you said, but the chance for loot and the chance for better loot also gets harder to reward that skill level of, of getting to further and further floors and being able to try out new weapons and items and stuff like that. Um, but how do you feel now about the difficulty? I mean, you've been playing it for quite a while. This is, I think this is one of those games on the podcast where, yes, you are a newer player, but this is probably the one game that you've put in the most time that we will talk about on this podcast. Oh, yeah, for sure. Like, I wish we could have done this a year ago. Yeah. Um, I don't know. There are some days where I feel I'm really great at everything, and then there are other days where it just knocks me down, which I think is the most exciting part about this game because I can never get bored. I can get frustrated, I can get excited, and I can get happy. But, I mean, I've been playing for, uh, you know, 10 months now. I've only unlocked maybe half of the items. <laughs> um, I haven't done all the quests yet. Uh, I haven't done the past. There's so many more things that I can do in this game that I just love it. Of course. Um, I think that's probably a good segue to actually talk about the game loop itself yeah. um, and what makes the game, you know, tick, mm -hmm. right? So we mentioned that it is a roguelike game, probably have beaten it to death at this point, uh, <laughs> but it is a game where you select uh, one of a couple characters that you start out with, you can unlock more, uh, and each character has a specific set of items or skill set uh, that they start with, which makes each run kind of unique. Um, right off the bat, because you can choose different playstyles. I know you usually choose the Huntress character, yes. um, who spawns uh, actually with a secondary gun, mm -hmm. um, as well as a dog companion. Yeah, I've uh, coined him Kevin. Yes, he is. Kevin is one of my best friends. He is known through all and of our circles of friends. And you can actually pet him. Isn't there a Twitter for that? You, yeah, uh, can you pet the dog? Yeah, yeah that's a fantastic Let me tell Twitter. you, yes, you can. 
Kevin loves the pets. That was an update. You couldn't always do that. Well, um, I'm glad I started playing after the update. Yes. Um, which is, you know, an, an awesome update to add to a game <laughs> of just being able to pet the dog. Honestly, well, yeah. Um, so, yeah, so you can pick one of several characters that all have different guns or starting items or thing like, things like that. They're all pretty balanced, though, um, because the game is kind of broken up into, I, I guess, three major types of items. Uh, the first is passive items. These are items, like in your Binding of Isaac, items that you would pick up that just kind of affect your game passively. They give you damage buffs, or they change the way things look and change the way things act when you're playing the game. You don't really have to worry about them, they just exist in the game. Uh, then you have your active items, uh, which are items that you can pick up and only hold one of in Enter the Gungeon and most other roguelikes. And Except you... if you're that special character. Yes, that is true. Um, but you can actually activate these items uh, whenever you want um, and press uh, a specific button. And these usually have a pretty big impact and a cooldown on the items themselves. Uh, and then, of course, besides that, you actually have all of your guns, um, which is kind of like the main point of gameplay. Uh, your ammunition, your damage, you know, thats it's all based on the guns that you find. So. Do you know how many guns there are? Oh, I don't. I think there's over 600. Jesus. Um, I can check real quick. Uh, have you found all the guns? No. Um, I, I think I found all the ones that can naturally spawn in the game. At this point, it's just achievements that will unlock more guns or purchasing them mm. from a couple of the late game shops. Uh, it's over 200 guns. I was a little bit highballing it. Oh, actually, no, that was from 2015. So, I don't know. It's a lot. It is uh, a, it's at a least lot of guns. 200. Yeah, at, at the very least, 200. <laughs> Um, different types of guns, but every character starts with an infinite ammo gun mm -hmm. uh, to kind of um, save them throughout the game so that they're not left like on the fifth floor if all of their guns run out of ammo and their starting gun, if that were to run out too, you'd have nothing left to shoot with, right? So every character starts with an infinite ammo gun that does a small amount of damage. Then some characters, like the Huntress, start with a secondary gun that does have a limited amount of ammo uh, that usually can get them pretty far on the first floor uh, because it's a better gun. I'm a second, let me tell you. <laughs> yes, depending on the character. Um, and then some characters even go so far as spawning with a passive item and with an active item as well. Um, I know, for example, the character you had mentioned, uh, the pilot, uh, spawns with a passive item that allows him to carry two active items, which I don't want to muddy the waters here, uh, talking about a lot of different items and stuff. <laughs> um, but yeah, it, it just shows you that characters kind of have a really unique uh, starting hand. And then, of course, the characters you can unlock are even more unique and very, very fun to play. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, the game's been out a while now. I don't know if we want to talk spoilers because they were added, but I, I don't know if they can count as spoilers anymore. But we'll get to that. <laughs> um, so you pick a character and you start the game by entering the gungeon, quite literally, yeah. as the name would suggest, which is kind of this large, uh, old, archaic dungeon that a great bullet fell out of the sky and kind of collided with, retrofitting it into this uh, domain for, for the bullet kin, as they're known as, which are these basically sentient walking bullets. And that, I mean, those are the enemies that you fight throughout the game. And it's very, very clever, but we will we'll talk about the theme in a little bit. Um, so as you kind of go through the gungeon, uh, you interact with all these different bullet kin that have their own arsenal of weapons uh, that they shoot at you. Um, I think your favorite maybe being the Lead Maiden that opens and closes. Oh yeah, definitely my favorite. <laughs> that fires I so many bullets. I tell you, I think it was the other day, and I'm pretty sure it was when we were recording. It was, yeah. I think in that footage one will probably be up right run, now. I walked into four five of yep. them I completely ended my game because let me tell you they're horrible <sighs> so i know you'd think uh playing a game like this where not only is the player shooting but all the enemy shooting i mean it, it's supposed to be a bullet hell so it really does get hectic with a lot of bullets on the screen uh but something that i really appreciate about enter the gungeon and i wish more games did very simply is they make every enemy projectile the exact same color it's that red to white bullet mm -hmm. right where where it's just like a little bit of a different hue but it's all a red and white bullet that every single enemy fires now they're different shapes and they have different trails to kind of depict if they're going to bounce or if they're going to move quicker and things like that but it really helps differentiate because all of your guns are just incredibly wacky right there's a spray gun that fires a constant stream of water that it actually leaves on the floor mm -hmm. the it, blood gun right <laughs> there's a gun that just spurts <laughs> blood everywhere one of them's just a tentacle that you oh, fire out yeah. and reaches onto enemies and grabs onto them so bombs? with bombs with so many projectiles in the game you'd get worried that you wouldn't be able to tell but enter the gun gungeon really slickly 
just is able to depict this by having all of the enemy bullets the same color and relatively the same speed so you can get better at dodging around them and, and mm -hmm. that kind of stuff and speaking of dodging as you're kind of running through the gungeon uh surveying enemies fighting them with your guns and picking up items and stuff one of the main mechanics and actually the namesake of the company is the dodge roll and this is one of the the very first things that you actually have to master when you go through the tutorial uh and sir manuel very fitting name um asks you to dodge roll through bullets now, when I first played the game, I mean, this, is, this isn't this is something you think of, right? When when there's a projectile coming at you, usually in other games, or someone's going to attack you, you either block or you roll out of the way, right? Mm -hmm. Enter the Gungeon, because of how hectic it is and because it's a bullet hell, there's a mechanic where you get invincibility frames when you roll through a bullet. So there is a time period where you can just roll through. I think it's something like one point, maybe 1.2 seconds is, is like the actual invincibility time that you have when rolling through. It might even be shorter than that. Um... But it, it's something that you learn, right? I mean, what was what was your experience when you did that for the first time? Well, I mean, I think you know better than anyone that I refused to dodge roll. You did, yeah. For a good chunk of the time where I started playing. So I actually started playing on Nick's Switch. So I didn't go through a tutorial. I had just watched him play, and I was like, how? Like, what are the buttons? Let's, let's, let's try this. I refused. I didn't want to dodge roll. It was too much for me. But once you get a hang of it, let me tell you, it's a game changer. It, it helps. really is so much yeah right it's hard to get in the mindset but it, it goes back to that thing we were saying before of mastery and skill oh, yeah. level right it's something that you learn mm -hmm. that you have to do and then all of a sudden you don't realize you're doing it well, yeah i mean i can still remember the day um i rolled over a pit for the first time i didn't have to stop before the pit think about <laughs> dodge rolling and then dodge roll i just completely <laughs> dodge rolled and let me tell you celebrations were in order of course no, it, it's it's so true, um, and I know this uh, was originally Dodge Roll's intention. Is the company Dodge Roll that worked on, on actually developing the game? Uh, they wanted to put a Dodge Roll mechanic in every game that they sub subsequently mm. made, right? Um, so one of the first things they prototyped in Into the Gungeon was a Dodge Roll, and to make sure that that felt good, um, and then being able to Dodge Roll through bullets, and because of that. There's a lot of passive items in the game that increase dodge roll length, invincibility time, speed, and then there's actually an item that allows you to, it replaces the dodge roll, and instead you can teleport, which is the uh, the bloody scarf, mm -hmm. which is a very, very hard item to use. Um, I'm not a fan. Yeah, but... It's above my pay grade. Right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, and as you kind of continue through the game, of course, uh, fighting, rolling, uh, there are NPCs, right? There are shops that you can mm -hmm. visit. Um, that change every floor. Uh, Who's your favorite? NPC. Yeah. Well, I think one of the cool things about Enter the Gungeon is the first time you play through, all of the NPCs are mm -hmm. locked. And this is my favorite mechanic in any game. If you ever play something like, uh, what was it, Drawn to Life, or any game, I'm a sucker for it, I'll play it immediately, where you can rescue NPCs and bring them back to a central hub. Probably my favorite game mechanic <laughs> in every game, and I wish there were more games that did it. Uh, Xenoblade Chronicles X is a game that does it very well. Um, I know John the Life is. Uh, so in Enter the Gungeon, similarly, right, you, the first time you start, it, there's that wow factor of there's no one in the main hub area except for, like, the tutorial guy. And then as you go in the in the Gungeon, uh, there are a lot of people that are locked up, and you actually have to save them. And as soon as you do, they return to the hub area, or they stick around on different floors in the Gungeon, and then they provide you different benefits. Um, as for my favorite... I don't know, I really like Cinder Grace. I know she was added like in one of the later updates of the game, mm. um, but being able to actively seek out a shop owner that synergizes a couple of your items in the game is a very, very cool aspect in my mind. It, it really entices the player to like come up with wacky combinations for their for their items. What about you? That's a hard one. I don't, I don't know if I have a favorite, to be honest. Maybe the king. Yeah, the Gunslinger King. That's kind of fun. I always get excited when I see him, so... What does he do? Well, so you go up to him, and there's a room where he's just chilling with his friend? Servant. Servant? Yeah. yeah. Let's say friend for this uh, <laughs> for this time. Sure. Uh, and he gives you a challenge. A challenge room. Um, completely random, to my knowledge, where, you know, you walk into a room, and it's either you have to, have, you have to start with a certain gun, yep. or you can't take damage, yeah. or... Slime spawn, which is honestly my <laughs> the, the death bane. of me. Yeah. Um, and if you complete his challenge, he'll give you your coins back or double the coins. He gives you your coins back, uh, and I think just a gun. It could be an item as well, but I'm pretty sure it's always a gun. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it's a really cool concept, yeah. right? Reward for challenge if mm -hmm. you decide to take it. 
Um, so with all of these NPCs, there's also shrines that you can interact with that kind of work the same way with different challenges and stuff that you can get from them. Um, shops, and then of course the chest system, which there are five colors that kind of follow the similar RPG of like uh, rarity, um, except it goes uh, brown or white is common, uh, blue is uncommon, uh, green is rare, which I know is flipped. Usually it's it's the other way around, where green is common and, and or green is rare and blue is uh, uncommon. Um, and then the red large chest is epic, and then the the large gigantic boss looking black chest is legendary, right? Mm -hmm. um, and it's very rare for a lot of those later chests to spawn, but the ones that do have way better items inside, right? Um, yeah. And there will always be two chests on every floor, two different chest rooms that you can find. Um, and then, usually off of those chest rooms, there can be secret rooms that you can break open the walls if they show cracks. Um, and you enter, and they sometimes just have items on the floor, sometimes notes, you know, stuff like that. Free chests. Free those chests. Are my favorite. Yes. <laughs> sometimes mimics, though, right? Oh. We love a good mimic. We love a good mimic. We love the baby good mimic. Oh, he's so cute. That's a great little companion. Can we talk about those? Yeah, yeah, we can talk about companions. All the little companions. companions you get? Oh, yeah. Honestly, uh, probably my favorite part of the game is all the companions you can get. I mean, I've talked about Kevin, my lord and savior, Kevin. Uh, there's also the baby good mimic, who is a little mimic next to you, unless you have another companion, and then he turns into another... A uh, duplicate. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Um, there's, there's the a police little, cop. Uh, the police cop. Yeah. There's a little turtle. The space turtle. The owl. Yeah. The phoenix. There's so many. Uh, the guys from that movie, our game. Oh, the Payday. Yeah, mm -hmm. the game actually had a crossover with Payday pretty early on, um, where in the Payday games, you could steal Enter the Gungeon trophies, because the Payday game is a heist game, where mm -hmm. you, you kind of go around and, and with your friends and you steal shit. Um so there was, they added a little bullet trophy to that game that mm -hmm. was from Enter the Gungeon. And then in Enter the Gungeon, they added three items from Payday, uh, which was a loot sack, a drill, and then the mask that you actually wear in Payday, or one of the masks. And then you're right, that gives you the actual companions as like little Payday heisters that kind of follow around, stun people, shoot people. It's pretty fun. And then, I don't know if it's the last one, but one of your favorite ones mm -hmm. that we hardly ever get, Sir Drunken. Ah, yes. Sir Junkin is literally from Junk, which you can sometimes get when breaking chests instead of opening them if you don't have keys. Sir Junkin is just made of trash, uh, but the more trash you get, the better he gets. It's a really fun game mechanic. Uh, but we're getting a little off topic here. Um, and a as you kind of clear the floors and fight the enemies, you eventually come to the boss, which is, is a very big turning point in all the games, right? So whatever floor you're on, there's a, a slew of different bosses that it could be, unless you're on any of the secret floors, or the, the fifth floor will always be the dragon that you find. Um, the bosses are really unique, but they all stick with the theme, right? They're all gun-related. A lot of them are puns, right? Uh, so, like, the Medusa you fight, uh, she's a gore gun. Um, the, the snake, right, is an ammo conda. Uh, there's a beholder you fight that's called the Eye of the Beholster. Um, yeah, a lot of great puns. Uh, they pose a real challenge. Like, even if you can ace the floor, sometimes the bosses just really, really shut you down. Yeah. It's sad. Yeah. But the rewards are always pretty great. True. And especially if you don't take damage. Ugh. We can only hope. Yeah, right? If, if you can manage to not take damage uh, against a boss, again, this goes back to the skill thing that we were talking about earlier. Um, the game rewards you by giving you an extra max heart, similar to how they did it in Binding of Isaac, actually. You could collect items. Oh, really? I don't know if it was specifically from bosses, it's been a while, but usually bosses would drop items that would increase your max health uh, for the next floor. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's pretty much the loop, and then you get down further and further. There's five main floors that you want to tackle and fight your way through, through all the different types of enemies. Um, and if you can beat the fifth floor, then the whole aim of the game is to kill your past, right? <laughs> in some weird like 80s inspired adventure <laughs> kind of thing that you do. Uh, the whole aim of the game is you are stuck in this gungeon and you are trying to, to kill your past. Uh, and the whole beginning of the game is actually about building the bullet that can kill the past in the first place. Um, so if you do beat the fifth floor, you have the choice of going back uh, to erase your past, which uh, of course would create a paradox, making sure you would never get to the gungeon, um, which is a problem in and of itself. Uh, but those, like, paths that you go to beat have very unique bosses that are specific to the characters, uh, which actually ties in a little bit of story, which the game is not a linear game, right? It doesn't try and push you on a story. It doesn't say you have to follow these rules and then go down this narrative. 
it hides narrative pieces in the descriptions of the guns, right, about the whole Blobulon army and, and mm -hmm. all that kind of stuff. And then in lore, when you beat bosses and you go back and you read through the boss descriptions, you can usually find out what time they entered the dungeon. Um, I didn't even know that. Yeah. Uh, there's actually an NPC in the main hub area where the first time you kill any boss, you talk to him, he gives you history about that boss, um, which is a very, very cool thing. I'm going to have to do that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but yeah, that's that's pretty much it for the loop, right? Yeah. <clears throat> you just kind of go through, uh, fight all the bosses, uh, try and make it to the end where you can kill your past. And of course, there are a slew of secrets um, that once you play the game a couple of times, you start to find and hunt. Um, there are a lot of achievements, actually, uh, that you can complete, which will unlock more guns for the game, unlock a whole bunch of items. Honestly, the reason I played it so much is because there's really limitless content. Mm -hmm. um, because there's so many guns and items, Technically, you haven't like really beaten or 100% of the game until you have collected every single one. Um, and there's still quite a few that I haven't collected. Like even between the PC and the Switch, I've just never done it and I know we're, we've been trying to. But there's still a lot of hard challenges in the game. Oh yeah. Um, so that's that's pretty much the whole walkthrough of the game. And I just wanted to take this, this next section to, to talk about my favorite aspects of the entire game, which is the theme, right? The reason in my mind why I think this game is so successful is because out of so many other games that are developed, indie games, smaller games, very few of them find such a core theme. A lot of them kind of default to the, the classic like pixel art fantasy theme, right? Um, or like post-apocalyptic themes, and which are all very fun. But I find Gungeon has such a unique steeped theme where the world is built so well and all of the gun descriptions, all the NPC interactions, and everything is just a pun, right? Everything mm -hmm. is a pun for different bullets and guns. From right when you start the game, the intro music literally is just a choir yelling, enter the Gungeon. Like, that is the music for the whole first part, which is fantastic. The elevators are giant shell casings that you ride down in. All of the bullet types are usually actually different bullets, right? Mm -hmm. You start out with like facing pistol bullet type enemies, then shotgun shells, sniper caliber rounds, like all sorts of stuff. Um, I just think the theme is, is really what sells this game and why people keep coming back to it, right? I mean, even your health, the UI in the game, which is a really, really cool thing, is gun related, right? Mm -hmm. They could have just given you a health bar and like an armor bar and stuff like that to show you that, oh, this is your health, this is different. But even the heart pieces are half of a bullet. And the blanks you get are actually like, they're blanks, right? They're, they're like little blue bullets that you would fire as a blank from a gun. I don't even think I realized that, to be honest. It's, it's just such a cool idea for a game to, you can tell they put a lot of love into it, right? Every single piece of that game, the loading screen, right? Is, oh, is a bullet beautiful. jumping into a, into a, um, I love that a little, chamber. Uh -huh. I don't know, I think it, it's really weird because I want to say it's so subtle, but it, it's not subtle at all. It's really in your face, but you almost don't notice yeah. it because of how normal it looks because it just it just fits. You're so right. And I, as someone coming into it for the first time or even early on, what did you think? I mean, it, it couldn't have been like anything you had played before. Oh, not at all. I mean, you know, we've talked about this a lot. I mean, all I really played back in the day was COD. I mean, I loved <laughs> COD. A different type of shooting game. <laughs> Um, Nick really introduced me to a lot of indie games, a lot of games I would have never picked up in a million years. And, you know, honestly, Gungeon was one of those. It was on the list of something I would never play. Yeah. I thought it looked cool, but I didn't really know anything about it. Uh, playing it by myself, though, I mean, it's so interesting. Just because, like, of the how much effort they put in to the art, I think, is what gets me in any game. But especially in this game, because, I mean, like you said, the loading screen. The... Um, the story at the beginning yep. when you're loading the game, um, just jumping into a new room, all the little um, portraits on the walls. Yeah. It's just little hints of the game everywhere. Yeah, I know. And honestly, I mean, that's that's what this podcast is all about, I explaining to seasoned players, right, the, the ins and outs of the game, and then making sure that newer casual players can be interested in stuff like this and, and why these games are fun for someone that right might not have picked it up mm -hmm. otherwise. But. Um, yeah, so I, I think it, it's a really awesome theme for the game. I think it's steeped so well, and not it doesn't break it at a single point. Like, every single, oh, like no. you said, it's just so tied down. Not a moment do you feel like, oh, this doesn't belong to the game. Every new enemy, every new boss, even all of the guns are just so fun and funny. The game doesn't take itself too seriously either, right? The humor oh, that they lace oh. throughout all of the, the NPCs' dialogue, all the gun descriptions. 
Not to mention the amount of references that are put in. There are yeah. so many guns from other games uh, that just reference things in other games. I know we just unlocked the Night Gun, which is a reference to Shovel Knight. Like, it's quite literally like a shovel on a gun. Um, yeah, I really don't know most of these references. <laughs> and I'll tell you, Nick tells me all of them, and they go right over my head. But concept really cool oh yeah they, they just take him from every i mean one of our favorite ones is the mega buster which is just straight out of mega man like that's not even a reference you just get the mega buster for mega Han, uh mega man um and then it allows you to change it right the synergies you get oh. so if you have a fire item or an ice item you can actually change it to be like in mega man when you beat a boss you would get their power so all of a sudden you can change the mega buster to fire fire or fire ice or whatever it is you have mm -hmm. so yeah um yeah, but that's that's pretty much everything I, I wanted to talk about uh, theme. Um, but I thought we should also kind of talk about... We had a little bit of an experience with the publisher, Devolver, um, when we went to PAX. Yeah, I'm a little sad about this, to be honest, because this was back in, what, 20... 2018? Yeah. Before I even probably saw Nick playing this game. Yeah, that's I don't true. think I knew a lick of what this game was, what this publisher was. I barely knew any of the games that were going on at PAX. Yeah. I was here for the experience. Um, but Nick had a pretty awesome time that I'm super jealous about. Yeah, no, so so uh, per usual at PAX or any other game convention, Devolver, you know, had a booth as, as a lot of other small studios do. Um, and I went up to the booth uh, and I, I talked to the guys briefly that were there. They were, you know, publishers and stuff, but they had a lot of Enter the Gungeon um, paraphernalia that was there, like t-shirts and stuff like that. I ended up walking away with a pretty awesome Enter the Gungeon t-shirt uh, and a pin, uh, one of the Penny Arcade pins. Don't talk about the vinyl. Oh, well, I was going to get to it because I didn't walk away with the vinyl. Mm. We left. That's true. And I had seen the vinyl, and I was like, wow, that looks amazing. Um, and they can hear it right now because it's playing. Uh, but the soundtrack to Enter the Gungeon, I want to say, is kind of like this synthwave-esque like, dungeon-crawling music. I don't know how else to describe it. I love it. it. It's really I good. Tell you. It's not lyrical, and it's not something that you could, like, I don't know, play on repeat, I don't think, but I love to have it in the background. It's it's a pretty cool soundtrack, yeah. right? Um, so when we saw the vinyl, I was really excited. Uh, but we had left that day for PAX. We actually got Nico to go back, because when we were leaving, I regretted it so hard that I did mm -hmm. not get a vinyl, because I heard them saying that they would sign it, a signed vinyl from, from Devolver, right? So we actually got Nico to go back because he, for something, for Overtone, I think, long story short. Hat. Right, no, but he got another pass. Yeah. Yeah. So he went back um, the next day or that afternoon or something uh, and ended up buying the vinyl. Uh, and sure enough, it was signed. And to this day, we have that signed vinyl of Event of the Gungeon. It is one of my favorite vinyls that we have because, it's, you know, it's the soundtrack of my favorite game. Yeah, I'll say, fun story about that is like we said this was in 2018 yeah. and i didn't start playing until late 2019 maybe um i had completely forgotten about this experience i had no idea yeah. like i it just went right over my head until we were going through our vinyls and i i was so surprised was like, we have an enter the dungeon <laughs> vinyl like no one wanted to tell me this and you know nick kind of looked at me and was like well you were there and it it dawned on me it sat and i was hurt <laughs> yeah it's a sad time but yeah um i think before before anything else we should just quickly talk about the development process that actually went into the game and you know devolver and, and dodge roll yeah, and everything like go that. for it um so so this game i it, it came about in 2014 uh we actually learned this relatively recently uh when developer dave crooks was listening to the soundtrack to the game gun gods by flambeer and the name gungeon just popped into his head so he, he approached his fellow uh, developer members, uh, assumedly on Dodge Roll, or even that might have even been before they formed the company. Uh, and then they just fleshed out the game. They thought it was a, a great name, and they just kind of built this bullet hell around that. And it was most heavily inspired by, you guessed it, The Binding of Isaac, right? Um, and it really shows. It takes a lot of influence from something like Binding of Isaac. Uh, which is, you know, a roguelike that you've wanted to play for a long time. We actually yeah. haven't, haven't gotten around I, to that yet. I'm, I'm nervous about it. Because I know in the land of um, roguelikes, we started off with Blazing Beaks. Easy, you know, I got confident. We're here at Gungeon. So, you know, I'll say confident. And I know um, Binding of Isaac is kind of 
looming over my head <laughs> where it's my next step but all i ever hear about is how hard it it's is so hard and i don't know if my little heart could take that <laughs> <laughs> gungeon might be a good it took point. me so long to get to the point that i am a gungeon that right. i don't know if i can start all over with a harder game <laughs> but maybe uh, we'll see down the line of course um and after development started uh, uh dodge roll reached out to devolver um, and kind of pitched the idea, and Devolver was like, okay, this is great, you know, let's set up a video, and they, they came out with an announcement trailer. Um, and I guess it was converted multiple times in 2015, it was revealed at E3 2015, um, and then finally, on March 2nd of 2016, it was announced uh, that the game would release April 5th. Um, and after it did release, uh, which it did so pretty well, it didn't amass like a huge following right away. Uh, but it was, you know, it was pretty popular. A lot of people made videos on it and stuff, and I, I saw it and picked it up and it was very fun. Um, the coolest part of this development, though, is every single content update they made after that was completely free. Like, they, they poured hours and hours of DLC-worthy content into this game that just came out as a free update. So many new bosses they added, hundreds of new guns that they added into several different updates, new characters, new post-game content. Like, it was stuff that I was willing to pay for, because I think the game at the time was maybe 15 or 20 bucks max. And I loved the game so much, I would have paid for any amount of DLC. But they were such good developers, they just said, no, this, this we want to make the game that we wanted off the bat, and we're, we don't think it's complete yet. So sure enough, they came out with the content updates, and they were all free. Up until... It wasn't that long ago. A Farewell to Arms was, well, April 2019 now, so I guess a year, um, was the last update of the game, which which just kind of ended everything. But after that, uh, they're working on kind of sequels to the game. One of the ones they recently released was Exit the Gungeon. Uh, Pretty clever. Yeah, well, very clever. My favorite part about that game, and I haven't even played it, I've seen Nick play it a couple times, is solely the intro music. Because like Nick said earlier, the intro music to Enter the Gungeon is just them saying Enter the Gungeon over and over again. And I know me saying it doesn't sound that cool, but it is. And then for Exit the Gungeon, all I did was just change, change it, it to Exit the Gungeon. And the day I noticed that was, you know, I don't know. I was so excited about it. It made me want to play it. Yeah, no, it's totally. Uh, and I know they're working. I They debuted a uh, an arcade game. Remember when mm -hmm. we saw that? Yep. I think it was recently at PAX uh, mm -hmm. that they debuted that, which looked really cool, and I think featured the Super Space Turtle from Enter the Gungeon. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it did. Um, which was pretty cool. Um, but we are kind of encroaching. We definitely passed the 30-minute mark uh, at this point, um, so we didn't stick to our word even in the first episode. But before we go, <laughs> I just thought uh, we could mention uh, Total Deaths and Enter the Gungeon on your account, at least. On my account? Yeah. As of last night, I have 212 deaths. Wow. It, it, honestly, it says more about my playing than it does anything else. <laughs> well, but... The, <laughs> <laughs> the problem, though, is it doesn't measure successes, right? It only no. shows you death. So you've done, though, at least 212 runs. Yeah. That's a lot of runs. I had fun in almost all of them. I, cu I couldn't calculate between two of them, but I think the one on my Switch was, uh, I think, also close to 200 uh, deaths that we had, and I don't even know how many was on the PC um, from way back when on my laptop. Um, but yeah, that's that's all the time we got for this week on uh, Leveled Up. Ash, do you have any closing thoughts about Enter the Gungeon? Or maybe thoughts for people that, that thought it looked cool or maybe didn't want to pick it up or anything like that? Uh, get ready to be frustrated. Um, it's not an easy game, I'll tell no, you that. No, it's not. And let me tell you, it was way, way more fun playing it with a friend. It's true. I think my favorite memory of this game is being a player too. Because it's just fun playing with someone else, and you do a lot better. So <laughs> <laughs> give it a try. All right. And on that note, I've been Nick. And Ash. And you've just been leveled up.